Wow, we had a full house today. <laughs> good afternoon. It's good to be back with you. Apparently, I was a little missed. Uh, we're one week out from the president's first foreign trip, uh, so I wanted to make sure as we prepare for that trip uh, that I bring up General, our National Security Advisor, General McMaster, uh, to give you a preview of what the team has been doing to prepare for the president's trip. Our, our goal is to kind of uh, start that process now and then next week uh, bring the general back and give you a more detailed uh, update as to what the president's going to be doing in each of the areas and some of the highlights from the trip. I will obviously, obviously additionally have background briefings for you as well uh, to give the team that's going to be traveling from the press corps um, some logistical updates. So without further ado, uh, General McMaster. Will you take questions after him, Tom? Yes, Jeff, I will be glad to take your question. In fact, if you'd like, you get to go first today. Hey, thank you, Sean. Good afternoon and happy Mother's Day weekend, everybody. As you all know, in exactly one week, the President will embark on his first trip abroad since taking office. Today I'd like to explain the President's objectives for his visits to the Middle East and to Europe, and also preview a bit of the schedule. The trip has three core purposes. First, to reaffirm America's global leadership. Second, to continue building key relationships with world leaders. And third, to broadcast a message of unity to America's friends and to the faithful of, the three, of three of the world's greatest religions. The President prioritizes building strong relationships, as you see here, every day uh, with world leaders as a way to strengthen our alliances. And he's been successful. You can see that in his diplomacy with a range of leaders, from, from Prime Minister May to President Xi. President Trump understands that America first does not mean America alone. To the contrary, prioritizing American interests means strengthening alliances and partnerships that help us extend our influence and improve the security of the American people. This trip is truly historic. No president has ever visited the homelands and holy sites of the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faiths all on one trip. And what President Trump is seeking is to unite peoples of all faiths around a common vision of peace, progress, and prosperity. He will bring a message of tolerance and of hope to billions, including to millions of Americans who profess these faiths. The President will focus on what unites us. The President's trip will begin in Saudi Arabia, home to the two holiest sites in Islam. He will encourage our Arab and Muslim partners to take bold new steps to promote peace and to con confront those from ISIS to Al-Qaeda to Iran to the Assad regime who perpetuate chaos and violence that has inflicted so much suffering throughout the Muslim world and beyond. He will lead the first steps toward a stronger more capable and more robust security partnership with our Gulf Arab and Muslim partners. And he will develop a strong, respectful message that the United States and the entire civilized world expects our Muslim allies to take a strong stand against radical Islamist ideology, an ideology that uses a perverted interpretation of religion to justify crimes against all humanity. He will call for Muslim leaders to promote a peaceful vision of Islam. The President will then travel to Israel. With President Rivlin and Prime Minister Netanyahu, he will reaffirm America's unshakable bond to the Jewish state. With President Abbas, he will express his desire for dignity and self-determination for the Palestinians. And to, to leaders and peoples alike across the entire trip, he will demonstrate his hopes for just and lasting peace. In Rome, the President will be honored to accept an audience with Pope Francis. He looks forward to paying his respects and to discussing religious freedom, ways to combat religious persecution, human trafficking, and cooperating on humanitarian missions across the, gl the globe. He will also pay his respects to the Italian people by meeting with President Mattarella the head of state and one of America's most important treaty allies and trading partners. You also see again 
Prime Minister Gentiloni, who is hosting the G7 conference in Sicily. From Rome, the President will continue to Brussels for the NATO leaders' meeting. There he will reaffirm America's commitment to the alliance, while stressing the need for members to pay their fair share, to shoulder responsibility, to share burdens, and for the institution to continue on the path of strengthening the alliance. President Trump will end his trip in Sicily for the G7 meeting in Taramina, where he will promote American economic leadership and it also address unfair trade practices. He will remind our friends and partners that we are eager to explore further ways to address threats to our mutual security, from North Korea to Afghanistan to the broader Middle East. Before leaving, the President will visit Naval Air Station Sigonella, where he will thank our wonderful and courageous servicemen and women, allied personnel and family members for their sacrifices to keep us safe. And across the trip, he will meet our, our diplomats, uh, the staff in our embassies who represent us so well across the world. Lastly, just a few words on how this all came together. The impetus for this trip came from the President himself, and he has been fully engaged from the beginning, setting objectives, overseeing the planning. The President is receiving regular briefings from his cabinet and from our senior staff here on the national security side and on the economic side as well. Uh, most of the leaders the President will meet on this trip, as you know, he's already met in person or certainly by phone. These relationships are off to a very strong start. And the trip is an opportunity to broaden and deepen those relationships. The administration continues to be in close contact and consultation with Congress, and we're drawing on the expertise uh, across the Senate and the House in preparation for the trip as well. And finally, this really is a team effort. The White House and National Security Council staffs, the National Economic Council, continue to work closely with our Departments of State, Treasury, Defense, and others to fulfill the President's objectives and ensure smooth execution. On behalf of the President, I express the whole administration's thanks for all the hard work it takes to organize a, a trip of this scope and of this importance. So the President of all of us are looking forward to the journey. And with that, I'll take, I'll take a couple of questions. Master, 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 Defer to Shonda. Master, how, how is this president viewed among our Arab allies, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and others, compared to his predecessor? Well, I, I'll just say the president's leadership has been welcomed, welcomed enthusiastically. Uh, there was a perception that America had largely disengaged from the Middle East in particular. Uh, and, and, uh, and that disengagement coincided with this uh, humanitarian and political catastrophe in the region. And so now there's a broad recognition among all of our partners in the region that American leadership is necessary to, to help address this catastrophe and to begin to move the region toward the peace, security, and stability uh, that the people there so deserve. And so what you're seeing, I think, is a galvanizing effect of the president's leadership and bringing those leaders together across the region uh, 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 under, and bring, bringing them together for a positive agenda, right? Who's against ending this catastrophe? Who's against confronting uh, these terrorists who are the, are the enemies of all civilized people? Confronting Iran, who's participating in this, in this cycle of, of violence, and to bring prosperity, peace uh, to, to, the, to the region and the people who so richly deserve it. Thanks. So you're somebody who is crucial, obviously, in the intelligence community, somebody who's leading the National Security Council. So I have to ask you, this week in particular, there have been a lot of reports, including from our network, that intelligence officials are extremely concerned about how James Comey was fired. Do you believe that that threatens national security right now? Well, I, I, told, I told Sean that I would pass all those questions to him, and he'll be happy to answer that after this, after, so after, after, after this. But I, what I'd like to do is focus on the, I'd like to focus on the trip. And I'll come back next week with more details of the trip as well. Thanks, John. Um, you said the president was the, the impetus for the trip came from the president himself. Was it the president himself who decided to begin this trip in Saudi Arabia, the, the, the birthplace of Islam? And is there is there symbolic significance to that? And, and how many of our Muslim allies, how many countries, how many Muslim majority countries? will be represented at the meetings in Saudi Arabia. Yes. Well, this, this was the president's initiative to begin the, the trip in the Middle East. Uh, hosted, 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 I'm ho hosted by, uh, by, by King Salman and the Kingdom of, of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, and the king uh, is going to bring together 
partners from across the region to meet with the president. So the answer to your question is, and I can answer it in more detail next week, because it's still coming in the sort of the final attendees, but he'll meet with a broad range of leaders in the Middle East, of course, many of whom, uh, most of whom he's met already here, uh, or, or by phone, certainly. And we have, uh, we have the, the, uh, the, the, the Crown, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed is coming, uh, for example, on Monday uh, as well. Steve. Sean, um, General McMaster, at the beginning of this very long week, uh, we were hearing speculation that the President was considering thousands more troops for Afghanistan. When he goes to Brussels on Thursday of next week, what is the message to the NATO partners with respect to their commitment in this long fight? Yeah. Well, the, the key is that all of us have to be committed, right, to, to achieving our fundamental objectives in Afghanistan. I mean, Americans know really better than anybody because the mass murder against our own country on September 11, 2001 originated with the terrorist safe haven and support base in Afghanistan. Recently, we have been engaged against uh, ISIS or in, in uh, ISIS Khorasan uh, in Afghanistan with highly successful operations there that you'll hear more, hear more about in a press conference at the Department of Defense here in the, in the, in the near future. Uh, but what has happened in Afghanistan is the Afghan army is taking the brunt of the fight against these transnational terrorists and the Taliban. Uh, and so we are, we're working with our allies to figure out what more we can do to have a more effective strategy in Afghanistan. What are options we can bring to the president to be more effective in meeting our objectives in Afghanistan? And what more can we ask our allies to do, which we're asking them now? So, so this is going to be really consistent with the president's guidance to us. Has the president decided that there should be thousands more troops? The consistent? president has not made a decision yet on a course of action. What we have done, which is what we have done in many cases on the, on the North Korea problem set, for example, is we've consulted broadly across our government and with allies. The president wants to hear from our allies as well. This is a president who listens to his allies and partners, who have an opportunity to do so at the NATO summit, who have an opportunity to do so at the G7. And so what we'll have at the end of, of this next few weeks here is an opportunity for a much more effective strategy for the problem set in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the region broadly. Jessica. Thank you, Sean. Um, General, if you could talk first about the evolution from a, the way the president campaigned, which was a more unilateral foreign policy, to this multilateral engagement that you're emphasizing and the way that you're rolling out this trip to explain that. And then secondly, if you could also talk about the decision to send a delegation to the One Belt, One Road uh, a forum in China and why, what you hope to get out of that. Okay. Thank All right, you. So, so America first never didn't mean America alone ever, I don't, I don't think. And so, and so what we have done is, is, uh, is advance the president's agenda uh, in national security by, by strengthening alliances by burden sharing. Americans don't have to do everything, don't have to bankroll everything, and our allies and partners are grateful for, I think, the president's leadership in asking them to do more. So it is an alliance in which each of the members are doing their fair share, who are shorting the burden. Is it stronger or weaker? It's stronger. So the president has done a great deal to strengthen our alliances. And America first didn't mean America not leading. Right? So for America to, to secure and advance its interests, that requires American leadership. And so so the president's leadership has been has been welcomed uh, in all of the places that, that he'll be visiting on on this trip, and uh, and and his agenda, I think that he laid out in in the campaign is being operationalized and implemented uh, by his cabinet primarily with the assistance of our team here in, in the White House. Vivian. Can I just press you on that, General? General? Um, two questions. Um, first, the, there were reports out of Israel that uh, President Trump may try to get Benjamin Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas in the same room together while he's there. Is that, in fact, the case? And also, um, to NBC News yesterday, the President said that General Mattis and his other generals would be announcing something on ISIS next week. And so as one of the generals on his administration, can you talk to that? Is there an announcement coming next week? On the first that part, it'll be whatever the president wants to do. You know, so, so a lot of a lot of what we do in the National Security Council is try to keep up with the president. So you may have no. I, I think it, 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 plans there, there are plans to, to reach out to both of them to uh, get them together. You know, the, the, fi the final plans aren't, aren't set yet. We can comment maybe more about that next week. But it'll obviously be up to the president and those leaders about how to how he wants to engage with them. But he'll engage with with both those leaders there uh, as part of the trip. In terms of the the campaign. Uh, against transnational terrorist organizations and ISIS in particular, the president has asked us to do everything we can to, to defeat ISIS and in particular to ensure that we defeat ISIS in this, you know, the so-called caliphate in the terrain that they that they are endeavoring to hold on to in Syria, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and other in other areas. 
And what the president has, has also told us is he doesn't want to telegraph what he's doing tactically day to day. He wants the Department of Defense and, and our military commanders to be able to execute those campaigns consistent with his guidance, the policy and the strategy that he's approved. And so what, what, we, what uh, next week will do will be an opportunity for our, our military leadership to lay out how, we are, how they are executing the president's guidance, the progress they've made in the campaign, and what, what remains to be done. And so that's really the emphasis of the of the of the uh, of the press conference next week. Thank you, General. Yeah. Can we sure. hear about Russia and the agreements that were made this week uh, with Russia's top diplomat? I mean, you're going to the region to speak with Arab allies. How are you going to explain agreements you've made with Russia, allied with Iran, in Syria, a place that the president has said is now a priority for? So I, would, I would characterize the engagements with with Russian leadership by our Secretary of State. Uh, the brief meeting that the president had with uh, former Mr. Lavrov, the, the the phone conversations that we've had with uh, with Russian leadership, as as uh, engagements, not not uh, decisions or, uh, or or specific approaches. I think what the president has made clear is that is that he will confront uh, Russian disruptive behavior, uh, such as its support for for the murderous Assad uh, regime in in, in Syria, uh, and its enabling of Iran and it, and its very destructive. Uh, destructive policy and strategy that is executing across the, the Middle East, uh, what, it, what it's uh, done and continued to, to do in Ukraine, he'll confront that disruptive behavior. But the President's looking for areas of cooperation. Uh, th there, are, there are a lot of, of very significant security problem sets across the world. Uh, all, all of them would get easier, right, if, if, uh, if Russia were to come to the conclusion that it could best advance its interests uh, through cooperating with the United States and others to resolve those conflicts rather than perpetuate them. But are they party to those conflicts and causing them in Syria? I mean, the president said at the end of his meeting with Lavrov that it was really good, that there was, you know, he spoke in very positive terms that there was progress made. Are you saying there were no agreements? The, the, the president spoke in, in positive, affirmative, strong terms. Uh, in his engagements with, with Russian leaders. Thank you very much. I'll just follow on my so question. I'll take one more. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the America First policy, about how it changed over time? Because it's not been very clear what it means and how other people would want to sign up for it. Well, what, what it means is that the president is prioritizing the security and interests of the American people. You can see that with what Secretary Ross has done uh, in, the relation, in the economic relationship with China, <laughs> to look for ways to advance American prosperity. Every theme of this trip is wholly consistent with the President's approach to prioritize American, um, the American people, American security, American jobs, American prosperity. And so you'll see that with, with I think, a, almost a, uh, a, a, a refreshing, I would say, integration of, of what we're doing in terms of security partnerships, uh, along with economic relationships, and and uh, and the diplomatic engagement uh, that the president's cabinet has been engaged with uh, since he's since he's taken over as president, and uh, and this trip is going to be a tremendous way to solidify the gains already made and, and advance them further. General, thank you, Thanks. General. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, General McMaster. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple updates and uh, schedule before I get to your questions, and Jeff will get the first one. Um, first off, Secretary Ross, I know, was up here last night to tell you about the developments, and General McMaster just uh, noted it, the developments that have happened and advances that have happened in trade. The ten commitments that Secretary Ross announced yesterday are the initial results of the 100-day action plan of the United States-China Comprehensive Economic Dialogue which began with President Trump and President Xi's meeting in Mar-a-Lago. Under the leadership of Secretaries Ross, Mnuchin, and their Chinese counterparts, the United States has negotiated intensively to reach consensus in areas including agricultural trade, financial services, investment, and energy. One of the actions I want to point out in particular sets the stage for China to allow imports of American beef beginning no later than July 16th of this year. It's been 13 years since our cattle producers have been able have been effectively locked out of the Chinese market. China is the second largest beef importer in the world, buying roughly 2.6 billion dollars of beef every year. In a statement last night, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association 
the nation's largest association of cattle farmers, said, and I quote, it's impossible to overstate how beneficial this will be for America's cattle producers and how the Trump administration deserves a lot of credit for getting this achieved, end quote. This announcement came on the same day that Secretary Purdue visited a large a barge uh, loading facility in the Ohio River and announced that he will appoint the first ever Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agriculture Affairs at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This is further proof of the seriousness of which the administration is approaching the promotion of U.S. agriculture products abroad. And that's just one part of the deal that was reached. Here are some of the other highlights uh, that we have worked with China. Eight pending biotech patents from the United States firms will be evaluated at a meeting of China's National Biosafety Committee by the end of May. We welcome China to receive imported liquefied natural gas with companies allowed to proceed at any time to negotiate tr contracts. China will allow foreign owned financial services firms in China to provide credit rating services and credit investigations. By July 16th, China will issue further guidance to allow American-owned suppliers of electronic payment services to operate in China. And China will allow two American financial institutions to issue underwriting and settlement licenses no later than July 16th. As we continue to make progress within the 100-day framework, including discussion of a one-year plan to solidify action that will benefit both of our countries. Uh, moving on, this morning, Attorney General Sessions issued a memo that restores flexibility to prosecutors so that they can most effectively combat the crisis of illegal drug trafficking that is polluting our cities and destroying our communities and families. This policy was formulated after extensive consultation with the prosecutors that handle these cases each and every day around the country. With these additional options available to them, they now have the leverage they need to get at the root of drug trafficking and the violent crime that surrounds it. As the Attorney General said this morning, this will take the handcuffs off our nation's prosecutors, and if I can add, it frankly puts the handcuffs on the drug traffickers who threaten the safety of our families and communities. The Trump administration is signaling to the worst of the worst, the drug traffickers who violate our drug laws to move these dangerous substances around our border and into our communities, that the United States Department of Justice will no longer look the other way. This week, the administration has also been busy engaging with senators and their staffs now that the American Health Care Act and the relief it promises for the American people is in the Senate's hands. I know Sarah talked to you yesterday about how Aetna has pulled out of Obamacare exchanges completely, leaving only one insurer in some of the markets. Another, another report yesterday out from eHealth showed that the average premium for individual plans has spiked 39 percent since 2014. In some cases, insurance premiums and out-of-pocket expenses have become families' most significant expenses. With each new report, it becomes clearer and clearer that we can't wait any longer to repeal and replace this failing system. Until we enact serious reforms of the health care system, the American people will continue to suffer under the consequences. Tomorrow, uh, the President will deliver the, his first commencement address in Lynchburg, Virginia at Liberty. He is greatly looking forward to visiting with Liberty students and faculty who gave him such a warm welcome last year. He can be expected to note to the graduates his own change in status since they were last together. As many of you know, Liberty is the largest Christian school in the nation and has in recent years made many remarkable strides in its forward, uh, strides forward in its academic, extracurricular, and athletic endeavors. Besides taking note of these achievements, the President will be congratulating the graduates on their accomplishments and encouraging them to be a force for good in the world by standing up for their values that Liberty has taught them. He will be offering congratulations, thanks, and praise and encouragement on a day of optimism and new beginnings for the graduates as well as the nation. In terms of the rundown for next week, uh, the President has a very packed schedule before we depart on his first foreign trip. On Monday, he's hosting the Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates. On Tuesday, he'll welcome the President of Turkey. On Wednesday, the President will travel to New London, Connecticut to deliver the commencement address at the United States Coast Guard Academy. On Thursday, the President of Columbia will be at the White House for an official visit. And on Friday, we set off for, uh, on the trip, with the first stop being Saudi Arabia. And finally, in honor of Mother's Day, this afternoon, the First Lady will host a reception in honor of military uh, mothers in the residence, followed by a performance by the Army Chorus and Marine Band. The White House will issue a Mother's Day proclamation later as well. Beyond all of the activity here, this is the official reminder to everyone to get your flowers and cards before it's too late. And with that, Jeff Mason. Thank you for that reminder, Sean. You're welcome. Uh, 
moving on to the news of the week, really, and the day, did President Trump record his conversations with former FBI Director Comey? I assume you're referring to uh, tweet. the tweet. And I, I've talked to the President. The President has nothing further to add on that. And why did he say that? Why did he tweet that? What should we interpret from that? I, as I mentioned, the President has nothing further to add on that. Is there <laughs> record, are there recording devices in the Oval Office or in the residence? As I said for the third time, there is nothing further to add on that. Does he think it's appropriate to threaten someone like Mr. Comey not to speak? I, I don't think that's that's not a threat. He's simply stated a fact. The tweet speaks for itself. Um, I'm moving on. John. Uh, if I could quote another one of the President's tweets this morning. He said, quote, Russia must be laughing up their sleeves watching as the U.S. tears itself apart over a Democrat excuse for losing the election. What did the president mean by that? How, is the U how specifically is the U.S. tearing itself apart over all of this? I think the president's comments uh, about uh, the Ru Russia and the collusion have been very clear uh, with respect to some of the charges that have been made. He's been very clear that um, it's one thing uh, that, that he believes that the investigate that the notion that there's collusion is a hoax. It's been reaffirmed by several people, including Senator Grassley and others who have spoken to him, um, and that he wants to make sure that he's focused every day on doing what's best for the American people. I understand all that, but we've said that many times, but how is the U.S. tearing itself apart? Well, I think obviously this has been a subject that comes up over and over again um, when it's been very clearly stated on multiple occasions that there's no collusion that occurred, and yet this narrative continues to be perpetuated. Do you think this is what the Russians wanted all along in interfering with the election? I, I don't. I have no idea. But what I'm just telling you is I think uh, we've made it clear at this podium several times, and I think the president made it clear uh, that what his feelings are on this. Sean, Sean, in the dinner that the president had with James Comey earlier uh, in, in, in January, did the president implore him to <coughs> pledge his loyalty to the president? Is that true? No. Did that happen? That did not happen? No. Uh, how important is it that the FBI director be loyal to the president? Is that, a, is that a quality the president wants to see in anyone, particularly his FBI director? I think the president wants loyalty to this country and to the rule of law. Try it. Sean, Sean. Thanks, Sean. On the dinner with James Comey, does anyone in this White House have an audio recording of what unfolded during the January 27th dinner between the former FBI director and the President of the United States. I, I'm not aware of that. I have one follow-up question for sure. you. Um, what can the administration do better when it comes to communication? Uh, today the President tweeted out um, that he uh, felt from behind that podium it's not always possible to present the information with perfect accuracy. Mm -hmm. So, I, look, I think um, we come out here every day and try to do the best job we can communicating what the President's done and the accomplishments he's making on the American people. Uh, we get here early. We're, we work beyond being here at this podium. As many of you know, we get here early. We work pretty late. Uh, we do what we can. But the president is an activist president. He keeps a very robust schedule, um, as many of you are very well aware, and as you can tell by the activities of next week alone. And I think sometimes we don't have an opportunity to get in to see him, to get his full thinking. Um, in those cases, we do our best to follow up with you. Uh, but I think that there are times when you more than not read a story where someone's trying to pin, trying to pull apart one word, one sentence and say, aha, and make it a gotcha thing. We work very hard to get you the most accurate and up-to-date information throughout the day. We don't always have the opportunity to get in to see the president. Uh, and in those cases, I think we do a pretty good job of following up and getting you the information after the briefing or in a subsequent. Uh, so so that's, that's, that's exactly what he meant. Is the president considering canceling the daily press briefings? I think he's a little dismayed, as well as a lot of people, that uh, we come out here and try to do everything we can to provide you and the American people with what he's doing on their behalf, what he's doing to keep the nation safe, what he's doing to, to grow jobs. Um, and yet we see time and time again an attempt to parse every little word and, and make it more of a game of gotcha, as opposed to really figure out what the policies are, why why something's being pursued, or what the update is on this. And I think that's where there's a lot of dismay, and I don't think it's something that just alone uh, the President feels. Can I ask you one, one final logistical sure, one question? Final. It's Friday. Um, on the original question I had about the dinner on January 27th with James Comey, right. um, the President wasn't clear during the NBC interview who invited the FBI director to the White House at that time. How many invitations did the White House send to Director James Comey after January 20th and before the director was fired? I don't know. I'll, glad, I'll try to get back to you. Katie. Hey, Sean. I have a question about the Turkish President's visit next okay. week. Um, he recently called 
President Erdogan called for Muslims to rush the Temple Mount. <coughs> uh, considering the President has said he's a mediator for peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis, what is his response to that? And then I have another question. So I think what you've seen with the President's meeting with, with these leaders is he engages privately um, in a lot of these things, and I think to a, to a degree, a large degree, he's been able to achieve great success, whether um, Aya Hagazi in that particular case, working behind the scenes, whether it's the progress that he's made with China. Uh, the president's uh, behind-the-scenes diplomacy is paying dividends for the United States, and that's how he's going to continue to operate. And I, as General McMaster noted, it's that kind of diplomacy that's reasserting our position in the world and that trust and those relationships continue to be built. Well, again, I, again, I, I think there's 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 a difference, Katie. If we can get out here, and um, I think what the president believes is that uh, behind the scenes diplomacy pays dividends in terms of affecting behavior and outcomes uh, and furthering the goals of the United States. So that that's as much as I want to say there. My other question is. Is the discussion about the refugee crisis, which is fueling problems in Europe, the president has talked about refugees being a problem in the United States and terrorists hiding refugees, um, or, ter or refugees hiding in the, terrorists hiding in the refugee stream, excuse me. Um, is he going to talk about that with Arab leaders specifically when he visits Saudi Arabia, or is that not something that he's willing to bring up? To those, I mean, those he's leaders. talked about safe zones. He talked about it yesterday with the foreign minister, or earlier this week, rather. He's brought it up on the calls. But in Saudi Arabia specifically. I, 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 I'm not going to get ahead of his conversations that he's going to have, but I think the president's been very publicly clear about his desire to address that situation and some of the the, um, the solutions that exist. Uh, but but he's, in, in a lot of the readouts, we've had that as part of it because he believes that that has to be part of a solution. John. President conducted yesterday with NBC, he indicated and confirmed that on three separate occasions he asked uh, the director of uh, the FBI and received assurances from the FBI that he was not under investigation by the FBI. Why was the president seemingly so consumed by this that he would ask that question on three separate occasions? I think because the narrative continued to be perpetuated and he wanted clarity to make sure. Uh, but again, I haven't spoken to him on it about the reason, but I think he answered it yesterday very clearly, um, and so I, I can get back to you, but that's that's the answer. I would appreciate your getting back to me, and as far as asking that question, uh, did the President ask the, the White House counsel whether it would be appropriate to ask such a question, given that it was against, generally, Justice Department guidelines to indicate whether or not investigations are ongoing against any individual, let alone one at the White House? I don't know. I will tell you that I know several legal scholars, including Alan Dershowitz and others, have said there was nothing inappropriate about that. Did Dave. Counsel to the White House counsel. I, I don't know the answer. Okay, no. thank you. Dave. Well, General McMaster mentioned that on the trip the President is going to be raising the issue of religious persecution, uh, leave of the Pope. Uh, and I wanted to ask you about a case in the last week in Indonesia where uh, a Christian governor in the state of Jakarta was imprisoned for two years for blaspheming the Koran. Um, does the president find that case troubling? Does he plan to say anything in way Did John Gizzi give you this question? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I, I, don't, I don't have any updates on, on that particular case. I would ask you to uh, check with the, with the State Department. Oh, as Zeke. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I just want to put a fire point on uh, Jeff's question. I'm hoping to answer this uh, in a yes or no fashion. Is the President of the United States currently recording conversations taking place in the Oval Office? I, I think the point that I made with respect to the tweet is the President has no further comment on this. Okay, Cam. One of the follow-up since okay. you were involved in this on Tuesday night as well, uh, giving a blanket answer saying at the time that it was all him regarding um, Deputy Attorney General uh, Rod Rosenstein. Why did you come out with information that was later contradicted by the president two days later? Um, could you explain the TikTok? When were you brought in? Who else was involved? Why were the American people given incorrect information that night? I, I don't. I don't necessarily believe that that's true, Zeke. Um, we there was a decision making process. The president explained it in the interview process. Uh, the bottom line is, is that the director of the FBI serves the pleasure of the president. The president made a decision to replace him, as he has stated very clearly now publicly. Uh, the president is now focused on making sure that he finds a replacement that has the leadership qualities to lead the FBI. That's it, plain and simple. Cam. Sean, I want to follow up on that real briefly. You know, what you said Tuesday doesn't match what the president was laying out. 
yesterday. Can you walk through why the discrepancy in terms of whose decision this was? Well, it's always the president's decision. That's it, final. As I mentioned to Zeke, um, the, the, this is ultimately the president's, always going to be the president's decision. Everyone who serves at the pleasure of the president is ultimately going to be his decision to hire someone, to fire someone. He made a decision, in part based on the recommendation, and he's now focused on making sure that we have a replacement at the FBI to instill the proper leadership they need. Blake. Throughout the way forward, as it relates to um, who the president might nominate to be the FBI director, where does that process stand right now? How many people have been interviewed? Um, does the president hope to wrap this up before he goes overseas? Um, on the timing, I, I think as soon as he finds a candidate that fits the qualities uh, that he feels are necessary to lead the FBI, that's the timeline of that. I know that the Department of Justice has begun to uh, create that list, and I believe they're going to, if they haven't already, are going to be starting uh, the process of interviewing people um, either today or through the weekend. But, um, I mean, the president obviously wants to make sure that we've got the right person, um, and they, that process is being headed uh, by, the, by the Department of Justice. About how somebody not necessarily being political in that role, if somebody has been a member of Congress, past or present, does that count as an automatic disqualifier as somebody who is? I, I have not. I don't. I've not asked the president, uh, but I don't believe that he has stated any sort of in and out. The the Department of Justice is screening candidates, and I'm sure that as they feel as though they've got a list of finalists, they'll share that with the president, and he'll he'll make a decision. And lastly, does the president still have confidence? The other day, we were someone asked. Does the president have confidence um, in Andrew McCabe after the testimony on Capitol Hill the other day? Is that still the case? He is the acting director at this moment. I, I've not asked him about the deputy. Uh -oh. <laughs> I, I've, I've not asked him about his. Generally, I don't go through the list of government employees and ask him. So I, I've not asked him specifically about that. Uh, Amen. Uh, yesterday, Sarah told us that the president expects that the FBI investigation will be wrapped up with integrity. That's what the White House wants. Today, the president uh, tweeted and called it a witch hunt. How does tweeting and calling it a witch hunt help wrap that investigation up with integrity? The president, you know, no one wants this done. Um, he wants to know very clearly. There's two pieces of this. Uh, right, which is what was Russia's involvement. And the president uh, is obviously very concerned about any entity's attempts to influence the United States election. And that's one investigation. I think the second, this false narrative that we continue to fight every day uh, that has been debunked by intelligence individuals, members of Congress who've been briefed over and over again, uh, that's where I think he's growingly concerned, as well as a lot, number of American people uh, who are growingly concerned that there is this perpetuated nip false narrative out there. That's, that's I think, uh, the nut of this. I talked to a former uh, FBI official today who said that the president's tweet, the implicit threat to FBI, former FBI Director James Comey, indicates that the president, in his words, is simply out of control. I'd like to get you to respond to that. Is he? I, that's, uh, frankly, offensive. John. John. Thank you, Sean. Two questions about the FBI director selection process. Uh, you said the names are coming from the Justice Department right now. Mm -hmm. Is the president consulting with Democratic congressional leaders as well, or Republican congressional leaders on this? Or is he just getting names out of DOJ? Uh, that's a good question. I know that he was, uh, obviously, he's going to take input from them. I don't know what specific conversations he's had. Um, so I'd be glad to check on who he's spoken to or, or maybe speaking to. Anita. I had a. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot you too. Follow up question. I got confused that Dave stole one. Now, I know that um, you, know, you said you're not disqualifying anyone on this. You also know there has been considerable mention in the last 24 hours of former House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Rogers as the new FBI director. Um, does the president have a meeting planned this weekend with Congressman Rogers? I, I'm not aware of anything of that nature on his schedule. But we'll obviously, as you know, we, we'll put out, if there's a meeting, uh, we'll put it out for you. Right now, uh, there's nothing that I'm aware of on the schedule, but generally we put out the, the next day schedule later in the in the evening, and we will we will do that as well. Kristen. I'm sorry. I'm, thank you. I'm sorry. Getting a little... Um, I had a couple questions about the president's remarks in, to NBC about General Flynn. 
Um, he said that it wasn't an emergency or he didn't think it was an emergency and that's why the firing dismissal didn't happen right away. So I had a couple questions about that. Is it because, why didn't he think it was an emergency? And it, was it because of the messenger? Was it because it, information came from Sally Yates, who you called an opponent, I think a political opponent of the president? Or is it because Don McGahn downplayed the situation? Can you explain what he meant by that? And I had a follow up. I can't specifically say what he meant by that, but what I can tell you is, I mean, again, look at the timeline that happened. Uh, we went over this the other day, and this has been asked and answered multiple times. The former acting attorney general came and said, I want to give you a heads up on something. Uh, Don McGahn, the counsel's office, informed the president. They asked for the documents or materials that she had referred to. It took, I, mean, I forgot now, five or six days to get those. They reviewed them, um, and he was uh, asked to resign shortly thereafter. But I think that that's, there is a difference. Uh, there wasn't a review process. That was the review process in this case. Uh, as the President noted yesterday during his interview, uh, he had been thinking about this for a long time. The Justice Department had done a review. Um, but again, I, I, I'm not really sure in both cases. So then since you just No, no, you just asked me, you just I asked me what's. Justice, though. Is that what you're talking about? No, what I'm saying is you're asking why why it why? wasn't an emergency, I think, but it's not a question of his emergency. He took the time to do due process. Someone comes to you with a, a, a an allegation, I think everyone deserves due process to make sure that that allegation, someone coming in and giving you a heads up, we did exactly what was necessary and the President made the right decision and it, he continues to stand by it. Okay, so then two follow-ups. One, why, I'm still unclear and you've mentioned this several times, why did it take so long for the White House to get those documents? I, I don't know. I think we've. The White House asking you couldn't go get the documents. That's not. I, I, making it sound that is, is rather, with all due respect, it, it's not how it works. They're the ones who possess the documents. They had them in their position. I believe they asked for them, um, and it took a while. Is it because but, she was fired though in between. No, I think part of it is just there's some of these things don't happen as easily in terms of where they're stored. I don't know the answer, but I think that in the course of action, if you look at the intervening days. Um, that's a question that you should ask the Department of Justice. Okay, and I said I had a follow-up. I'm sure. <laughs> Just explain to us then a little bit when you compare these two situations with General Flynn and Director Comey. The, the memo came one day, and he was fired that day. That was the review process, and General Flynn was 18 days. No, that's I, a huge difference. Why was one so fast when one was 18 days? Well, I, I think it, to, to, first of all, they both had a review. They both came, and the President looked at the information and the reviews and made a decision. Ultimately, as I mentioned, he's, that's his job. He's the decider. He felt as though he had the information necessary in both cases to act, and he did. Vivian. Sean, uh, in, the tweet, in the tweet about um, about Director Comey, he said, the President says that he better be careful before he goes leaking to the press. Yesterday on NBC News, the President called him a showboat and a grandstander. Does the White House acknowledge that Director Comey has a First Amendment right to speak to the press if he so chooses to set the record straight about any of this? Instead of just leaking, it's not. It may not be leaking. It may just be his First Amendment right to speak to the press. Well, one, of course, one. Everyone in this country has a First Amendment right. I think the difference, and you've heard the president echo this multiple times, is that sharing information that's not meant to be or is not authorized to be in the public domain in terms of the classification of it is concerning. And I think the president has been very clear over and over again of his concern um, with respect to information that gets put in the public domain that's not meant to be. But I, 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 I don't. I don't think that those are – everyone in this country has every right uh, to speak their mind and express themselves in accordance with the Constitution. Okay. And a follow-up. Just in terms of the FBI being in disarray, also with the President's comments, is he concerned that if he continues like this, the, it could jeopardize morale at the FBI instead of actually kind of correcting a problem that he obviously observes there? Well, I think that one of the reasons that he wants to go through the process of finding uh, an individual who can lead uh, the FBI. Um, and, and the men and women who serve there so bravely and ab ably is to make sure that morale and the focus is is as it's supposed to be and that you have a leader that can do that. Um, and, and, you know, as you mentioned, it's the crown jewel of law enforcement. And I think the reason that he wants to go through this process uh, and choose a leader that can be uh, restore leadership, ref ref you know, ensure that morale stays where it needs to be um, and that that there's a focus. That's that's why he's conducting uh, the process that he has. And um, so, Jessica. Can I get my question to Kristen and then take the question back? What's that? <laughs> she, she, you called on her first, so I just wanted to give her the Thank question you. that you promised her before, and Thank then I'll you. pick up from there. Thank you. I'll ask you a question. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask you. Currency exchange back there with questions. <laughs> I want to ask you a 
President Trump seemed to rely on James Clapper this morning when he tweeted that virtually he and everyone else with knowledge of the witch hunt says there is no collusion. Um, James Clapper himself today told Andrea Mitchell, I don't know if there was collusion or not. I don't know if there's evidence of collusion or not, nor should I on March 5th on Meet the Press. When he was asked a similar question, he said, not to my knowledge. So can you describe the discrepancy and explain it? No. I, I'm, I actually think that that's a great question that you should ask Director Clapper. I think... Now between Director Clapper's comments and President Trump, why is he leaning on Clapper when he said, I have no knowledge of whether there was... No, I think on several occasions, Director Clapper has said that he has no knowledge of any collusion. That's it. I mean, that's that's the point that... He, he, has, he hasn't been briefed. He said he wouldn't know because he hasn't been briefed. Well, he was DNI up until that's January 20th. He was very clear today that he said, I, nor should I have in this particular context... He made the case that he's right. not and, and on, on an FBI investigation, that that's not his purview. F fair enough. He's the director of national intelligence. On multiple occasions prior to today, mm -hmm. he made it very clear that he was unaware of any collusion. But on, point was he wouldn't know. Well, right? but there had been no final conclusion. Right, I understand. No final conclusion. I, I understand the that, but then, so, that so the question that I would ask then, Kristen, is then why did he say what he said before? It seems <coughs> his testimony and comments on multiple occasions prior to today was, I have no evidence that there was any collusion, right? So to suddenly today shift a story, I believe that the question should be asked to him. You were the director of national intelligence. You said multiple times, including in testimony in front of Congress, under oath, that there was no collusion. I believe that that's a question for him. Final conclusion made about this investigation, right? There's an ongoing investigation. I, I, He's not making that argument, is I he? understand, but, but my point is, is that all we're able to do at this point is that the people who are aware of the former director of national intelligence, the head of the nation's agencies, intelligence agencies, um, makes multiple statements as others, Charles, you know, Senator Grassley and others, talking about the involvement, making it very clear that there was none. Uh, we took him at their word then, and we continue to believe... But I, I well, then, that, again, I, I think question. that, but the question, Kristen, before you move on, is then why did he make the statements that he did when he did? To turn around now, months later, and say, well, even though I made those comments on multiple occasions, you know, I, did, I wasn't briefed? I, well, I appreciate it. It's not surprising or abnormal that I would not have known about the investigation. Yeah, it sounds like the story the has changed. the context of the investigation. Right. Okay, well, ultimately, there's been several... Very quickly about the accuracy. Well, I can't, do you mind if I... I just, I think in this case, it is interesting how the story has changed. He made those comments several times over several courses of action. And to say the Director of National Intelligence, who stated unequivocally what his position was on multiple occasions before today, and now suddenly is saying, I wasn't sure about it, that the burden seems to be on him, not us. He wasn't saying he wasn't sure. He said he wasn't sure. But moving on to the accuracy. You're for like a clapper spokesman. The, job, no, but I just am interested in the discrepancy and drawing. A final and I think that that's a great thing to ask him. No, on the part of the president, okay. drawing a final conclusion about the investigation. In terms of the accuracy tweet, should we take that tweet to mean that you don't have the full picture when you stand at that podium? As I said, uh, we come up here every day, not just to the podium, but. Um, you know, we, we are here first thing in the morning to late at night every day answering your questions on a variety of subjects and throughout issues that are happening in the government. We, as, as most of you can attest, work day and night to make sure that we get you the most up-to-date, accurate information at all times. With respect to the president, as I mentioned, he's an activist president. He keeps an unbelievably uh, busy and robust schedule. And there are times when we give you the information that we have at the time and we seek to get an update. And I believe that you and others will attest to when we don't have an answer, we try really hard to either update you after the fact or to get you uh, the facts that we didn't have at the time. But we work really hard every day uh, to do that. And I think the president's point that I pointed out earlier is that there are times when um, when we're asked a question, we do our best to give you the answer, and every word is picked apart to try to figure out how to make an issue out of it as opposed to allowing us to, you know, talk to the president, get his current thinking and updates if we hadn't had an opportunity to do that at this time. Oh, Jennifer, sorry. Jennifer, sorry. Jennifer. Can I, thank you, Sean, can I actually pick I'm up I'm sorry, there? Jessica, then thank we'll do so the J's. So I wanted to ask you about the One Belt, One Road Summit mm -hmm. that starts on Sunday in yes. China. Um, you announced yesterday our, our Secretary Ross did that um, you're going to send a delegation to that summit. Yeah. Can you talk about 
how you came to that inclusion, conclusion, why it's important for the U.S. to be represented at what's ostensibly a major trade initiative by a foreign country. I, as you point, it's a major trade initiative. Uh, there's a lot of ports and infrastructure that they're looking to do, and uh, through those discussions that Secretary Ross and Secretary Mnuchin and others had at uh, Mar-a-Lago, and, and part of this is that that, that is something that they've done. We, we're going to continue to work with them. Obviously, uh, trade is a major issue for us, and they're, what they're looking to do is, is of uh, great importance to our economic and national security, and they've asked us to send, uh, send people to that. Uh, and we have them attend things that we're doing as well. And I think that's, as the President has shown, in terms of the relationship that he's built with President Xi and the rest of the team built with their delegation, those relationships are clearly paying dividends both on the national security front and on the economic front. Jennifer. Does the signal that the U.S. is going to participate is it, in the One Belt, I, I One think Road initiative? We'll, we'll have a readout. Uh, at this point, uh, that's all we have on One Belt, One Road. Two questions. The first one on loyalty and the next one on the visit to the FBI headquarters. So this president does value loyalty. Was there any sort of, before you were hired, any sort of request or hint that you pledged personal loyalty to him at all before you were hired? No. I've pledged my loyalty to the Constitution and to the American people, as has everyone who serves in our government and this administration, and we stand by that. President was warned that he might not be well received at the FBI headquarters if he were to visit. I, I don't, not that I'm aware of. Thank you guys. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Thank you. Bye. Did you ask the President if he has installed listening devices in the White House? Did you ask the President? The briefing started with National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster laying out some of the President's upcoming first foreign trip, which will get, get underway next week. And the uh, press secretary.